Yes, I'm looking the tight to the potential for ISO 9001. Um, Mark has already introduced me, uh, but you now have my uh, mugshot on the screen. Apologise for the somewhat disreputable hair, a uh, product of lockdown. My name is Richard King Davies. Uh, I'm a lead auditor for ISO 9001, TL 9000, and ESD 2020 for TUB Sud UK Business Assurance Division. Mark has already touched upon this uh, mantra that we have, the spark that ignites and sustains continuous improvement on the journey to excellence. This is something that runs through virtually everything that we do in uh, the Business Assurance Division in the UK. Um, so we will we always are, are looking to this mantra because this is what we're trying to do as an organisation. Um, I've been just a quick background about my career. I started off my career in on around and under North Sea oil platforms. I spent some time working in the nuclear fuel reprocessing industry as well as the electricity generating industries. Uh, I have been a third party lead auditor for management systems now for 21 years. And I've audited people in 55 countries around the world. However, I do not consider myself to be an expert on ISO 9001 2015. And there's a very good reason for that. Because the standard ISO 9001 is not prescriptive. It is not a how to guide on how to implement a management system. And because every organization is different, they all have their own interpretation and takes on ISO 9K. And because I've not seen every organization, millions out there that are certified, I do not call myself an expert. I've been around the block with it a few times, without a doubt, but no, I've not seen every organization. Uh, for hobbies, when I'm not working and traveling, although not a lot of traveling going on at the moment, I throw myself off mountains, hang gliding, uh, and I do uh, do some sailing as well. And a personal mantra in my life is the Latin you see there at the bottom of the screen, which translates very simply as laughter and happiness. And actually, that's something I try to bring to the audit um, scenario as well, because I sincerely believe that a day without laughter is a day wasted. I just want to touch upon uh, the, uh, the the slide title and um, uh, uh, what we're trying to do, the and what I'm trying to do through this webinar. Uh, it talks about deriving the future benefits of implementing a management system from and that they start from the moment the decision is made to obtain ISO 9001 certification. Um, I'm looking to touch a little bit about the planning has to consider what you want out of certification beyond certification. And uh, the target of obtaining a piece of the paper on the wall is usually the end game in the planning. The purpose of this webinar is to try to identify try to uh, overcome some of the pitfalls that my colleagues and myself have seen over the years that can result in a very stressful and sometimes very expensive piece of paper hanging on the wall. Yet it does not have to be. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that we've got all of the pitfalls or I'm covering all of the pitfalls. Uh, I've just restricted uh, the numbers of the big ones that we tend to see and I'll go into those in a minute. There are massive misconceptions out there, fake news as to what ISO 9001 requires. Um, despite the history uh, of 9001 uh, since 1994 as an international standard, uh, there's still a fast belief uh, in those misconceptions that they're still out there. So I'm looking to see the most commonly seen problems that we have uh, in the organization. Um, one of those misconceptions, document everything you do and then do what you document being one of them. We'll be looking at that in a, a little bit of detail in a bit coming forward too. Um, I'll also touch upon the longer term goals for business management system certification just beyond that piece of paper uh, and how to look at enduring mechanisms on a journey beyond ISO 9001. However, that's going to be a subject for a future webinar as it is uh, worthy of a webinar in and of itself. So let's just take a quick look at the uh, motivations that people tell us as to why they're being certified. I think this is a very, very good place to start understanding some of the issues and uh, the obstacles that people face during uh, the certification process. Usually there are two drivers that are quoted when we are engaged uh, to be a third party certification uh, body in the form of TUFSUD. 
The first is that the requirements are coming from a specific customer. They're coming from a tender or contract requirements where the terms are of uh, the engagement between the, the different organizations requires certification to ISO 9001. Uh, the second one is usually an, an attempt to improve or gain access to markets, both domestic and foreign. So those are the two real drivers, and then they're an imposition on the organization. And I find it very rarely, very interesting that rarely we are told as one of those drivers to improve the business. I think I can safely say that I've seen that maybe two times in 21 years, um, which is uh, set speaks volumes in my book uh, about a lot of the misconceptions and the aura around uh, certification. So, but that's really what the organization should be doing to improve the business. So when we look at that, most that motivation, and this is why it's so important, the motivation is actually almost forced on the organization. We've got to do this to meet the customer requirements. We've got to do this to be in the market. It's not, we want to do this. It's, we've got to do it. And because of that, you actually kind of get a begrudging compliance. Uh, to uh, to follow the requirements rather than an active buying. So the actual motivation for becoming ISO 9001 certified is, is a, an important factor as to the pitfalls that come along. Uh, consequently, because it's a begrudging compliance and we've got to do this, the buying and the belief of what the organization is trying to do from 9001, it really isn't there from the leaders. There's no true belief. Uh, frequently heard is, uh, I said, well, I will speak to organizations where uh, the prime representative of the organization. I asked, well, why are you involved in this? And he said, well, my job involved the word quality. Uh, ISO 9000 is the word quality on the front cover. You do it, just get us certified. And that's the instruction they get. Then usually the next one is, by the way, we've got to be certified. We've set a date, end of the year. And thus, you can see why, when you look at these motivations, why people will seek out the easiest and fastest route to get to certification and not a lot more. They'll get the piece of paper on the wall. That's without a doubt. There are the common pitfalls, though, and these are the there's six that we've identified, and I'm going to touch on those uh, during the course of this webinar, and it's the fundamental uh, subject matter of the webinar. The first of all, the first pitfall is the bosses. The second is just get us certified. The third is life after certification. Four uh, is overs. I'll go into a bit more detail what the overs mean. Number five is feeding auditors. So you could actually call this spoon feeding auditors. I'm sure that's uh, piqued your attention already. Uh, and then reinventing the wheel at pitfall number six. I'll now go into those in a little bit more detail. So the first one, the bosses, or more accurately, leadership. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the requirements of ISO 9001, uh, it's uh, the section on leadership has changed from top management to leadership with the 2015 version. Um, however, much of contemporary leadership that we're talking about basically does not understand ISO 9001, even its grassroots. There's so much fake information around there. For instance, the uh, document everything you do and, docu and do what you document. Equally, leadership, because they don't have a full massive belief in the system, in the certification, they tend to abdicate responsibility and do not fully, fully support the certification activity. Your job involves quality, you do it. Leadership don't understand their role in ISO 9001, and there are so many requirements on top man on leadership in the uh, in 9001 and leadership don't actually get what it is they're supposed to do. I, I, it's not a question, I don't think, of them not fully understanding. It's tying in the benefits of what ISO can do to what they do every day, because that actually should not be a vast difference. Quality is only touched upon in many management courses. For instance, MBA programs devote a very small amount of their time to touching on quality co concepts and quality uh, ideas and how those quality concepts can improve a business. Irrigance, and this is what it leads to, irrogance. Yes, that's my own word. It's that subtle combination of arrogance and ignorance 
um, amongst leaders. Uh, I'm not going to go into a bit more of the detail, but I'm sure you can um, you can join the dots between what I've said and uh, uh, what what and the word arrogance. There's a lack of an understanding as that the management system must must work for the business. If the management system is not working for the business, it's a very very expensive piece of paper on the wall. So this is the first pitfall. Then it's the bosses, it's leaders. And it is, in my opinion and my colleagues' opinion, head and shoulders above the other pitfalls that we'll be examining. So business leaders must, must, must educate themselves and take the true quality concepts to heart and have a 100% undying and absolute commitment to the quality concepts. They must eat them, sleep them, breathe them, evangelize them through the organization. They need to be those concepts, those quality concepts, the basic quality, as I call them, quality laws must be part of everything that the organization does. We need to improve constantly and forever. I'll say that again, because I'm going to touch upon that in a much later slide, improve constantly and forever. We need to learn to love problems. We need to learn to surface problems. Leaders need to learn to figure out and embrace the problems that organizations get because those problems have solutions and those solutions bring with them massive learning. Uh, an auditee that I recently spoke to coined the phrase or gave me the phrase problems are precious. I wish I'd come up with it because it's so simple, but it really speaks volumes. Problems are precious because there's always learning in, in, in problems and how we overcome them and how we deal with them. Leadership must be prepared to shift their paradigms, their existing beliefs, their behaviors, and to educate themselves on quality concepts, on the ISO 9001 standard and what's it beyond. I don't expect any leaders, I don't expect anyone to be able to quote verbatim the ISO 9001 standard at them, but they should be everywhere in their thinking. And then when all this learning has happened, it needs to be integrated into a management system that becomes the part of the DNA, the beating heart of the organization that controls everything that goes on is that management system. So overcoming the pitfall is the true belief is needed by leadership at all levels. Without that, the journey towards certification and beyond is incredibly tough. The second pitfall, just get us certified. This can be an internal brief to uh, a quality person because he's got the word quality in, their, in his job title or her job title. It could be an external brief to consultants. Um, and more often than not, when I speak to organizations uh, about uh, who have worked with consultants, the consultants have done exactly what they were asked to do. They've looked at what their brief was and the brief typically is just get us certified. I've seen one or two instances that it goes beyond that, and that's always a good thing to see, but typically just get us certified. No strategic thought is given to certification. We just need that piece of paper on the door to do business with this particular client. The target for certification is the end of the year, nothing more than an arbitrary deadline. It's not about when we've got everything ready or when everything is effective and working, the target is the end of the year. And it's very little coincidence that in the industry that I work in, the auditing and certification industry, that our busiest year, busiest period of the year, sorry, is Q4. We are absolutely snowed under and have been for 20 years in Q4. And the reason for this is because certification audits are happening to meet that arbitrary deadline in November and December. And the future cycle is that's based on this date. So after certification audits, then we have two surveillance audits falling in Q4, and then a recertification audits uh, that might have occur a little earlier, but still falls into Q4. So it's no coincidence that our busiest time of the year is because we've set a target for a deadline. So it's brilliant that, isn't it? Just think about it. We've got an auditor coming in, just before Christmas, when everyone is not winding down, but certainly thoughts are turning to uh, to Christmas time. It's also approaching the financial year end for a lot of organizations. 
not exactly the perfect time to be doing an audit. So as a result of this, the piece of paper that's hanging on the wall after certification is a record can be massively expensive. And I'm not talking about the costs of auditing the system by, for instance, to have stood. I'm talking about the maintenance costs that go into it because of the lack of planning, a realistic planning, a lack of the understanding that comes about with it. It becomes a very bulky system. It's not delivering much in the way of value and it is expensive. So I'm posing a question. Is it odd to consider a post-certification life before certification even happens? To me, the answer is obviously no, it is not odd. In fact, it's, a, it's mandatory to consider, to my mind mandatory, to consider life after certification. There is life after certification, I wish to add, um, but it must be that, that concept, that idea must be fundamental to the decision to implement the requirements of ISO 9001. Strategic thinking must accompany that decision to obtain ISO certification. I'm going to quote here from ISO 9001, section 0 0.1. The adoption of a quality management system is a strategic decision for an organization that can help improve its overall performance. We very rarely see that considered when we come to these certification audits. So when we are when we are overcoming the just get us certified and life after certification, there are several things that need to be considered. And I believe that as a minimum, two questions must be asked. The first is what do you want from your management system in five plus years after certification? Once we've got that piece of paper on the wall, what then? What do we want our system to do for us without costing us a darn fortune? The second question, what do you want your management system to do for you as an organization? That piece of paper, I keep talking about that piece of paper all, it might uh, help you get into an act, uh, access a market. It might uh, enable you to do business with a customer. So therefore it's very important, but is your system really helping you achieve what you want? And when you're discussing the answers, some of the following things must be considered. The must the first of all and key the management system must help us improve the business and it must support our overall strategy or your overall strategy your values your vision your mission your customers both now and in the future and when i talk about values vision and mission well, let's not get bogged down in the language of these things it's where you want to go as an organization what you're trying to achieve through your organization customers now you're existing in a certain market what's what's the uh, the the trends going on in the market you're work, working in um what other standards do you think might be coming down the road at you in the future for instance environmental management systems 14001 health and safety management systems ISO 45001, information management security systems uh, 27001. It might be that your industry is moving towards these and, and certainly we're now seeing um, a move to sustainability uh, in, in supply chains. This is going to be part of what we're looking at coming down the road as, as organizations. So we need to consider those standards because our management system must be created in such a way that it enables those other standards to be implemented or integrated as one within a single management system that addresses all of the requirements of the standards that you're looking to be certified to. So the way to overcome this, let's develop a strategy that looks five years out, Look, uh, develop a strategy for what the management system that you're thinking about, what it's going to do for you, what it's going to look at. Um, certainly I see so rarely that people are developing strategies for their management system. In fact, I've worked with clients that even after a recertification audit, so they've been certified for three years, still do not have a long end term view of what their management system is going to do for them. There needs to be a focus on building something that where effective, effectiveness is the prime consideration, not the arbitrary deadline, not that deadline get us certified by Christmas. Actually, what is it going to do for the business? 
and is the system going to be effective in helping achieve our long-term goals? Once we've figured that out and we're moving away from the, the blurb in ISO, actually leadership will even more enthusiastically support all of our ISO 9001 related things. Fundamentally, if your management system is configured in such a way that it helps you uh, achieve your objective X years down the road, uh, if you've got a strategy for it that goes out long time, if you're looking at effectiveness, the long-term ownership cost of the management system will be virtually eliminated because it's helping you achieve your objectives. It's helping you reduce costs. It's also in, uh, delivering increased profitability. And of course, the real kicker as well, it helps with your customer satisfaction. It will increase, especially as if you're getting issues with your customers, your system will have a way, your management system will have a way of looking at those issues, to solving them, to understanding what caused those issues, uh, and your customer satisfaction will increase. So, pitfall number four, the overs. Um, apologies for the uh, bit of uh, smoke about this, but um, this is just to touch upon the most common misconceptions again, or the most common misconception uh, that we've seen about ISO 9001 that's uh, talked about not everywhere, but certainly everyone who speaks about ISO 9001, I say, oh, that's just about saying what you do and then doing what you say, or document everything that you do and then do everything you've documented. It's, uh, it's very straightforward, isn't it? It doesn't really help matters, all that stuff. But the problem is with this misconception, it leads to over number one, which is over documentation. Uh, hand in hand with Doc, uh, over number one is over number two, which is over complication. So the two overs are over documentation and over complication. So let's take a look at over documentation. Um, and that's my source of reference uh, is directly from ISO 9001 2015. Uh, for the uh, uh, more nerdy people amongst us, uh, that's section 7.5.1, but it's fundamental. It's, and it talks about the extent of the documented information for a quality management system. And it can differ from one organization to another. No organizations are the same. No companies, no two companies are the same. So everyone has specific needs. The size of the organization and its type of activities is a fundamental consideration. A small, a small organization uh, will need less in the way of documentation than perhaps a larger one might. If your activities and processes are complicated, you might need more documentation. Uh, if you're in the regulated industry, for instance, nuclear or medical, uh, you might need, you're going to need more in the way of documentation. It also depends on your products and services as well, what you're providing to your customers. If your processes are complex, if you've got very complicated manufacturing processes or service delivery processes, and how they interact with everybody in the inside your organization and in the outside world, you're going to probably need more documented information. And the competence of persons. Just prior to this uh, webinar, uh, I was reading something that came, I saw in a, in a flight magazine, uh, go back to my hobby being hang gliding. And it says, uh, some researchers have showed surprisingly that competence was inversely proportional to the degree, degree of proceduralization. Sometimes a lot of organizations who have massive amounts of procedure, procedures and documentations lose the ability to think because it's all in the documents. However, when we go into visit an organization, particularly for the first time, we see, and I'm using these words wisely or advisedly, an almost absurd amount of documentation. I've even seen a, uh, an approved, released procedure in an organization on how to make coffee. I kid you not, absolutely ridiculous. And it's a temptation to do it, to do too much. So that's the first thing, an absurd amount. Document what you feel you need to document for your organization. You understand your organization better than any auditor can do. So you document what you feel is, uh, feel is appropriate, but you must remember the requirements in ISO 9001 that talks about the minimum amounts of documented information that's required. 
One of the adages I use uh, is the effectiveness of a management system is inversely proportional to the amount of documentation. So if you've got a, a, a management system, for instance, with maybe 50 or 60 people in with four or 500 documents, uh, it's time to break out the laughter box because, frankly, uh, there is huge doubts. There can only be huge doubts as to how effective those that huge number of documents can truly be in helping the organisation. And you can see now why it becomes expensive because all of those documents need to be managed. They need to be reviewed. They need to be updated. They need to be uh, then released. People might need training on them. Very, very expensive. Second pitfall, as I mentioned earlier, going hand in hand with over documentation is over complication. I've seen procedures and my colleagues have seen this as well which are so tortuous, so intricate, so involved, that in fact, if you followed them to the letter, it would be impossible to obtain an output. I've, I've come across this on more than a few occasions. I've seen documentation of a self-documenting process. What is a self-documenting process? So SAP, so salesforce.com, all of the process steps are built in to the tools themselves. Um, and I've then seen documents and procedures on how to run and what to do within a self-documenting process. Sure, with a self-documenting process, it's only appropriate to capture the inputs, the outputs, the interfaces with other processes, the responsibilities, although sometimes that can be absolutely built into, uh, into those tools, as well as the monitoring and measuring activities so that you know that what you're doing is effective. The mantra I use, you'll see oil person, kiss, entirely appropriate. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and that is really such an important aspect of any management system. The simpler it is, the easier and the more effective it will be as people will use it. A picture tells a thousand words, flowcharts, videos, photographs, all of those things can be considered. There is no requirement to use the written word in ISO 9001. Equally as there is no requirement to use the language contained in the standard as well. So think about if you can use pictures. We're not novelists, we're not poet laureates. Simple as that. You know, our com most of us are command of the English language, we think it's good, but actual fact, when we start writing things down, it's very quick, it's very easy to start becoming objective. Well, you know what it means when you write this down, Equally, so you've got an element there of, of potential obfuscation going there with the processes that are being written. The next is when they're being read. Other people can read different things into different words, into different sentences. So when you've got lots and lots of writing going on, the opportunities for error start to become big because of that objectivity. Spoon feeding auditors, oh, I love this one. Um, Typically speaking, there's a massive information uh, or a massive concept out there of what us as auditors need to see. Um, and one of the free, most frequent uh, ones that we see is that people, auditors expect us to document absolutely everything you do and do everything you've documented. Um, no, not really uh, at all. Typically, we are looking to, there are certain things that we do need to see. The medium you use is entirely up to you. That is beyond doubt. But a halfway decent auditor will not want to see reams of documentation. Can be appropriate, though, to have that, as I explained. What we're actually looking for is to see actually that the things are effective, not just the volume of, the, the, of paperwork. Auditors. Guess what? We're not important. Uh, we like sometimes we like to think we are, but we are not important at the end of the day. Auditors look at your business for a day or maybe a week in a year. You have to live with your business for 52 weeks of the year. So that gives a bit of a perspective for the presence of that auditor in your business for a week in a year. So that is a perspective you cannot lose sight of. Again, we're looking for effectiveness, not mountains of paper. We're looking to see that you can show that what you do is effective. You could reword that to say you need to be able to, you need to know what you do is effective. And that's the top. One of the things that a good auditor will do is how do you know your system is effective? 
We're looking to see that your system's properly implemented and appropriate, properly and appropriately implemented. We need to check that it's effective and that it aligns with your strategy, but making sure that the 9,000 requirements are met, of course, as well. You, a good auditor will challenge you. They'll kick the tires of your management system because we're trying to promote discussion. The auditor is in your business for one week. The next week, he might be in a completely different business altogether. So what we're trying to do as auditors is we're trying to understand how your business functions in a very short space of time. One of the ways that we do that, get to that learning, get to that understanding of your management system is by challenging it so you can further explain what it is that you're doing. Why? Because auditors are trying to learn. If your auditors don't understand the above, show them the door and don't be frightened to do so. Let them leave the building, say, yep, yeah, very nice to meet you, goodbye. Because don't forget, it's a commercial arrangement between yourself and the auditing organisation. You are paying us. If we're not delivering what you want, if we're not understanding your system, and you've got a reasonable, uh, a reasonable reason to suspect that, show the auditors the door. Honestly, this doesn't happen enough. It does not happen enough. One of the things that you should do is identify and meet your auditor very early in the certification process, not two weeks before the auditor is due on site, but meet that auditor, interview your auditor, make sure you understand them, make sure that they're, they're a good fit for your organisation long before any audit takes place. And if they don't fit, find another auditor. Simple as that. They've got to fit. You've got to be... Uh, a, a, a symbiotic relationship between yourself and the auditor. Engage with the auditor during the audit, before the audit. If you're disagreeing with what your auditor is saying, auditors are certainly not God, they're not, you know, they're not even very important. If you disagree with that auditor, voice that opinion. Don't be frightened to voice it. Go ahead, have that discussion, because the auditor might have got completely the wrong end of the stick of what you're trying to do, might not fully understand, might have a very good point. But if an auditor is disagreeing with you and is thinking that there is a problem with the organisation, there is a methodology for writing these problems down that does take that auditor opinion from opinion to fact. And that is the three-step problem writing methodology, where the requirements is the first step, so defining and writing out in verbatim what the requirement is, then what the statement of the problem is, the statement of non-conformance, followed by the evidence that it follows up. That takes it from opinion to fact and cannot be argued. If the auditor cannot do that, there is a question as to whether the auditor is right or not um, and should be challenged. If your auditor cannot justify their conclusions, perhaps because it's opinion-based, again, cannot say this enough, show them the door. You are paying for the auditor. And this is a personal note. This is me uh, just talking a little bit about what I feel um, personally that I've experienced over the years. Um, frankly, I'm not interested in seeing ISO 9001 in a management system. Um, I, that's, that's my job. I know the standards or something in my brain. And what I'm looking to do while I'm looking at a management system is I'm looking to see the touch points with what you as an organisation are doing and where that touches ISO. That's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to be spoon fed personally with the 9001 requirements. Know them. What I'm interested in is how your organization functions. I'm curious. I, I, I think I'm fairly fortunate. I call myself a perpetual student. I love learning. I love figuring out how organizations function. So I want to know that. I'm not interested in the standard. Already know that. Let's move on to more interesting stuff like how your organization works. One question that I'm always going through my brain when I'm doing an audit, and it's like, if I was a customer of the company I'm auditing, can I see the controls in that management system that's going to give me a level of confidence, a high level of confidence that I'm going to get what I want, when I want it, at a price I'm prepared to pay? That is what's going through my brain. It isn't necessarily all about the requirements of 9,000, but they are going through there. I want to know, I want to come to a conclusion 
but if I was a customer, would I get those three things? And that is the cornerstone, or as I always call it, the three-legged stool, the fundamental concepts of quality. Now, a lot of companies have maintained quality manuals. There's no requirement in the 2015 version of ISO to maintain a quality manual. Some people have maintained them. Even new people, uh, new organizations feel that a quality manual kind of pulls everything together um, to, to, to frame the management system, as it were. If I'm looking, if I'm given a quality manual to look through and have a look at, if I, the first thing I will do is always go to the contents page. And if that context page lists the section numbers from the standard and the section names, I know it is not going to be the best day of my life because there is some more about if this management system will be more about ISO than it is about the company. Reinventing the wheel. Excuse me, I just need a quick drink of water. Apologies. There is nothing new about quality. Most of it has been done before, and there is all sorts of reasons for this. It's like the laws of physics, the laws of quality are constant, they don't change. So most of it's been done before. Yet many organizations go about creating their management systems from within a, within a bubble, thinking they've uh, got to do it their way. And there is a massive amount of truth in that. But the approach, the process approach has been a central tenant, a fundamental tenant of ISO 9001 for 20 plus years now. So there's a massive body of knowledge out there. There's a massive information out there. Some of the, the most successful company in the world, successful manufacturing company in the world, Toyota, have put most of their how-tos and what they do and their philosophies, their concepts, thinking of the seven wastes, for instance, or eight wastes if you include the waste of human potential. They've put most of this stuff out in the public domain. Yeah, when I come to audit people for the first time, or even after that, so very few people have actually looked outside of their organization to see how other people have done it, how other um, other people have implemented controls and concepts into their management system. It goes back to pitfall number one about leadership, the bosses, learning about how other organizations do it. Equally, Dr. Deming published his 14 points for management in 1988. They're quality laws. They're the same as the laws of physics. They, they're as true today as when they were published 30 years ago, and they'll be true in 20, 30, 40 years' time, if not longer. Yet how many people are aware of Dr. Deming's 14 points for management? In one of my earlier slides, I said uh, about leadership, improve constantly and forever. That is one of Dr. Deming's 14 points for management from 1988. Very few people have even known them. Yet it's fundamental stuff to how they're making their management system work. So my advice would be to take time to do research, to see how other organizations have created their management systems. People, for the most part, are flattered to be asked. They want to show off the good things they do. And that's right, it's fantastic. But if they're not asked, they can't, they can't do it. Of course, Maybe asking your comp competition, your direct competitors, how they've done it might be a bit tricky, but most organizations are flattered to be asked. Nevertheless, your organization is unique to you. So look at the way other people have done it. Borrow some ideas, tweak them, but make them work for you. I just want to touch quickly on off the shelf systems. They do have a place. Um, just bear in mind with off the shelf management systems. They are not built for you. So therefore they cannot understand your business needs. And the second part is they are part they fall into just get us uh, certified. They are typically designed to get the piece of paper on the wall and pretty much only that. So with off the shelf systems, my mantra is caveat emptor, buyer beware. Not forgetting that the bitterness of poor quality and cheap price lingers long after the sweet taste of low price has worn off. Hopefully in the preceding 20 minutes, if you're still with me, I've discussed the more significant ones today. I'm under no illusions that those are the only six. There's loads of them out there. But the ones that we've seen, the ones that I've talked about today, typically appear to be the biggest ones that people see. That doesn't mean that others don't exist. Be steadfast. 
hang on to it. Think about these pitfalls. Try to overcome them. Keep thinking, uh, things simple. Get leadership involved. Make sure leadership are absolutely devoted to the management system that you're creating. And not forgetting what the Dutch philosopher Spinoza said, all things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. It's not an easy thing to do it, but the benefits are amazing of doing a management system well properly. But just to recap once more, most common pitfalls that we've identified. One, the bosses. Two, just get us certified. Three, life after certification. The overs, so that's over documentation and over complication. Spoon feeding us auditors and reinventing the wheel. Those are the six ones. Finally, thank you so much for your time today. I hope this webinar has helped you and will help you on your journey to certification. Please do not hesitate to contact my colleagues or myself into UK's Business Assurance Division. The, the contact details will appear later in this uh, in this presentation, and they'll, as you'll be getting a copy of the presentation, uh, they'll be there for you to contact. Equally, I fully realise that I'm still going on my developmental journey. I'm still learning things, and that's one of the things I love about my job. If you've encountered or you've experienced significant pitfalls that I've not covered in this presentation, I would love to hear about them, so please don't hesitate to contact me. After all, every day is a school day. Again, just to touch upon what we're trying to do as an organization in business assurance is that we're trying to ignite and sustain the journey to excellence with continuous improvement. I would like to say a huge thank you for your time today. Uh, I find it a bit bewildering that anyone would actually want to sit and listen to me, but thank you anyway. Um, and I'm sure that there might be some questions. Mark, uh, I believe that uh, you might have uh, some questions if there are any coming in. Do you have any questions that I might be able to address now? Yes, indeed. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Some really interesting uh, points there. And uh, we've got three questions. Hopefully uh, we can get through them in, in the Mark, remaining three minutes. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Mark, I'm not sure if you're on mute, but I can't. Are you able to share the questions, Mark? I'm uh, hearing you. Okay, I shall uh, try to share the questions. Um, Hello, Mark. Yeah, you obviously oh. can't hear me. Um, I shall. I, I can just about hear you. Sorry, Mark. I can just about hear you now. Okay. So the first question was, um, how long does an ISO 9000 audit take? And how long does it last for? Ah, that's a good question. And um, yeah, thank you to the asker for that. Um, sliding scales, how long is a piece of string? But let's talk about the factors that influence uh, um, how long an ISO audit takes. Um, the audit, uh, the ISO audit, the way we calculate the amount of time that we need to spend doing certification audits, doing surveillance audits or recertification audits is based predominantly on the headcount, the number of employees in any organization. A large organization with many employees, it's going to take longer to do. For a smaller organization, it will take it will take less time to do. It might be that we need uh, we need to go uh, with two auditors or more in an audit team uh, to cover everything in a reasonable amount of time. How long does it take? I've done audits that take a day, I've done audits that uh, take uh, nearly a week and a half, depending on the circumstances. So it's about headcount, uh, it's about risk, and, and the size of the organisation. Uh, did that answer the question, Mark? Uh, can you just it, refresh my memory? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and Ooh, one, right. one, Just one more question, because we're, we're just about to run out of time. So can the audit be done remotely? Absolutely. Depending on the circumstances. Remotely at the moment, because of COVID, yes, we do have special uh, approval to do remote audits where I'm sitting at home or people can be sitting in an office auditing the folks within an organization. Um, I think the rules once COVID hopefully uh, goes into abeyance that there will be a future where we do what's called blended audits, which is where we're doing a combination of on-site and off-site remote audits. So the answer to the question in short is yes. Hopefully that's excellent. answered it. That's excellent. Thanks very much. Yeah, sorry guys, we've run out of time, so uh, we need to just wrap up now. So, so thank you very much to Richard, and thank you for joining the webinar today.
Um, I think some key points uh, include obviously getting management buy-in. I think that was very clear um, and making sure that the auditor that you choose or the organisation you choose to engage with is there to add value to your business and not just give you a certificate on the wall. I think that's a really important point. Um, as mentioned earlier, we'll be sending you a copy of the presentation and the recording. So our next webinar is, um, is on the 27th of May and it is uh, around the subject of second party audits. So this will be focusing on the audits of suppliers in areas such as social responsibility, sustainability and, and many others. So if you want to register for that, you can visit the website and the link will be in the presentation that we'll send you. Please get in touch if you um, would like to know about something that we could do a webinar on in the future. We'd really like to hear from you. And if you've got any other questions, please feel free to add them to the chat, which will remain open for a few more minutes. Um, if you want to get in touch, then it's info at tufsud.com or the links uh, are on the screen and will be in the presentation. And finally, on the behalf of myself and our presenter, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Again, sorry for the delay getting started, but I'd like to wish you uh, an enjoyable rest of your day. So thank you very much and goodbye.